guys. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be getting some isopods this week. Now, to get prepared for those isopods, we've got to make sure that their housing's ready. So all this stuff in front of me is all some of the stuff we're going to talk about and just trying to get these containers ready for so it makes it less stressful on the critters when they come home that we can just land them right away and everything's good. Now, you see where I am. For those that you don't know, this is the kitchen. Most of you can probably tell that, but I'm not usually in the kitchen. I've been in the kitchen in a few videos, and when I come into the kitchen, it's not my territory. It's definitely the territory of my wife. If you're normally allowed in your kitchen, good for you. Uh, I usually do stuff like this in my kitchen, and then I get in trouble because I don't clean up properly afterwards. So I have to promise to clean up really, really good. And because I'm in the kitchen, don't forget your wife permission slip. I got my permission slip. It says, husband's allowed to use kitchen when wife's not home. Signed wife. And conveniently, it's not dated. So I've reused this repeatedly. So that's pretty cool. Now, I've already told you guys a little bit about isopods and what they are, but because they live on the forest floors and stuff like that in the different areas of the world, they're gonna need basically what you would find on the forest floor. A nice, loose, rich soil that's got lots of air, but also retains a fair bit of moisture in different areas. So I've got some organic potting soil that has no fertilizers added to it whatsoever. I have some orchid bark, which is an orchid media. This one actually has uh, some tree fern in it and some orchid bark, which is fir bark. And it's also got some charcoal. And uh, that's all a nice mix already, perfect for orchids. That'll work good in mixing in with the soil here. And then I've got some highly moisture retentive uh, New Zealand long fag or sphagnum moss. What we're gonna do with that is we're just gonna chop a bunch of that up and add it to the mix. And probably the biggest component is this one here. This, com this product here, now this company's funny because they never ever actually want to tell you what it is. Like pretending, they're gonna pretend like nobody knows what that is. But basically the product there is uh, by this company, they call it plantation soil. If you buy it from ZooMed, it's called EcoEarth. If you buy it at any garden center or any place that does hydroponics, it's basically core. And core is the husk of a coconut ground down and it works excellent. It's a super moisture retentive mix. It's nice, it's loose, it's airy, it's wonderful. It lasts a very, very long time for terrarium use and vivarium use. The one thing that you gotta need to know about when you're buying it in the brick format though, specifically the ones that are sold primarily in the hydroponics reasons, is core is very, very retentive of salts. So what I recommend to people is when they sell it in the brick form like this, you have to take it out of this package and then put it into a bucket, just use a bucket, a nice clean bucket, throw the brick in there, and then cover it with some boiling water or hot water and let it soak. And that's gonna probably fill up three quarters of that five gallon bucket, at least half of it. So you're gonna get a lot of product out of that little compressed brick. But by doing that, by using that water, especially if you're using it from uh, the ones that I, I was mentioning that come, the, the, the more cheaper ones, is uh, you also are gonna be doing that as you're gonna be leaching out some of those salts that are in the media itself. So that's really important, especially if you're gonna be using it in a vivarium for things like amphibians or dart frogs or something like that that's a bit more sensitive. Now, as they live on the forest floor, I've got pieces of cork bark. Little pieces of cork bark will be the platforms which will go on the surface that the, the isopods will probably use mostly as shelter. I've got some, because I keep a lot of uh, shrimp and everything downstairs, I've got a lot of different types of leaves. These are some Indian almond leaves. I have some oak leaves downstairs. And these are some newly harvested magnolia leaves I just brought back from my recent trip down to Kentucky. These are some sort of decorative leaf litter that'll work fine. And this stuff here, this is also not only is this, is this, is this great for leaf litter and opening up the mix, but this will also be a great food source for them as well. Is this is my uh, harvested and dried stinging nettle, which you guys have seen in some of the other videos as well. So we're just basically gonna break all this stuff up minus the bark, and we're gonna put it all into a nice mix. On the top of uh, the units themselves, they're basically just sterilite containers. I just picked them up at your home store or house store. Sometimes grocery stores carry them. I'm gonna put some holes. I'm just gonna use a soldering iron and I'm just gonna melt some holes through here so there's nice aeration in all of them, but still not, not a breeze and not enough to dry out the medias. And I'll probably put a few holes on the top to let moisture escape. But the first thing we've gotta do is we've gotta soften our media. So let's do that first. So I've placed the brick of core into a bucket of hot water and you can see it starts to come apart really quickly. 
absorbs water. You'll use up all the water that's in that bucket. Brick's getting smaller. Stuff just comes off. It's just, it's really, it's just a product that's a dry product and they just, they crush it together, or, uh, compact it together to be able to make it easier for shipping and so forth. But it's a good, ad good advice to be able to prepare these different types of medias the day before you're going to need them because uh, I'm using pretty hot water here. And uh, you're going to want that media to cool down, but you can see already I'm getting lots and lots of product already. All right, guys, I went out in the yard and I also collected some fresh sticks and stuff like that, some nice dried sticks. By chopping them up and cutting them up into little tiny pieces, that'll add a, a lot more dimension in the wood mix and stuff like that in the forest floor mix. And our core mixture, our, our coconut husk fiber, is all ready to go. It's, uh, it's all boiled down and it's all nice and loose. So we're about to start making the mix. So before we get started on that, I gotta open up the bag of this one. So we don't make too much of a mess. Wife's not home, so we're okay. What are you doing in the kitchen? Apparently wife's home. <laughs> nothing? Doesn't look like nothing. Nothing to see here. There's a lot to see here. What are you doing? <laughs> I have my permission slip. That's null and void. Nope. Looks like you're making a mess. A, it says wife on it. Permission slip. I didn't sign that. Yes, you did. It says wife. That's hey. not valid. Get out of my kitchen. We gotta make our bug mix first. What the hell you are? Get out of my kitchen. We're making it. She said hell. That's a bad word. We don't use words like that. So we're gonna mix a bit, Mark. Go away, wife. We're gonna make a bit, a bit of a uh, bit you of the organic. Put mud on my counter. No, I'm not. There's no mud on your counter. We're gonna do a mixture of about half organic. Go away, wife. Nothing to see here. You better clean. Jedi mind trick. Jedi mind trick. See, works every time. Didn't work. <laughs> so now we're gonna make a mixture. We've got the organic potting soil. And we're gonna take a. A good, about the same sort of amount of the, the coir, the coconut fiber, the loose product. That brick is completely gone. The nice thing about this stuff is it's also it's already retaining the moisture already, so. Nice, loose mixture that's rich. That's enough of that. You can see I'm getting mud on her counter. She went outside, so we're okay right now. We can do whatever. We throw mud around. Oh, you'd be in so much trouble. You don't even know. Okay, so we've got our pot, organic potting soil with no fertilizers or anything like that in it. We've got our core product. So you can kind of see it's a, it's a nice mix, right? The other things we're going to add to it is we're going to add a fair bit of uh, the loose sphagnum, uh, sphagnum moss. We're going to chop it up. We're going to add some of the orchid bark, which is as the fur product and charcoal, a bit of tree fern in it. We're going to crush up some leaves, put all that in there and make a nice loose mix. I'm just going to kind of rinse my hands so I can go to the next one here without making too much of a mess. Wife was supposed to be away today. Now we have to get a new permission slip. So we've got our orchid bark. Also has a bit of perlite in it and stuff. That just makes a nice, loose, airy mix. We've already got our topsoil. Put that one away. Next step up is this uh, long, fa uh, fiber, uh, long fiber sphagnum moss. I'm gonna take a, a fairly loose handful here. I know we just shave it. And of course, it's gonna fly everywhere. So I'm gonna to have to not only clean the counter, I'm gonna to have to disinfect the entire kitchen because I'm gonna get in trouble otherwise. Only for you guys. I could, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> the reality is all this, doing all this extra work and cutting up and making it the right size and everything like that. You know, what happens? I think these bugs actually live in the wild on the ground. I think they'd be fine if I didn't bother doing this, but Hey, this looks really cool, so I'm gonna do it anyways. We're gonna have some fun. The nice thing is, the, the thing with isopods is, is some of, they're, they're all tropical species, the ones that we're gonna be keeping primarily indoors because otherwise they, they, would need a, they would need a winter rest or something like the ones, that, the ones that would live here naturally would always need a winter rest. So if we kept them indoors, they would probably shorten their lifespan. 
But uh, by keeping the tropical ones, sorry, I got sidetracked. <laughs> the, 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 by keeping the tropical ones, the thing that we've got to remember is that they won't always just want wet or dry. They want to have kind of different areas within the media. So if I use the long sphagnum as is and didn't chop it all up, they would have a media that would probably have lots of pockets of very moist areas and stuff. So by breaking it up a little bit, is it'll give probably different textures to the media, probably a little bit better overall for the health of the animals. Easier to maintain, I think, if, the, if there's kind of a little bit throughout. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. So just mix that all up. What else can we put in there? I'm going to take some of this stinging nettle leaves. When they're dried, there's no issue to handling them when they're dry. They're, uh, they don't have any of the, the little spines and the, all that sort of stuff that we're used to dealing with. You're dealing with raw ones when you picked them right off the plant. They're not fun. But by picking them this way, it's really no issue at all. So we're going to mix that in there. And then we've got more for this one. And it breaks up pretty, pretty quickly. Looks like I'm making the world's worst possible cake recipe right now, doesn't it? Dave, Gordon Ramsay wouldn't be pleased. Uh, what else we got? We got some Indian almond leaves. Oh yeah, let's bam those in there. Oh, smells delicious. Some other type of fancy leaf. You guys, you guys are just getting excited. I, it's just mouth-watering already, I can tell. Lucky she went outside, because she saw me doing all this and all this. It's like something that an eight-year-old would do in the sandbox or something like that, and it's not something that a husband should be doing probably in his wife's kitchen, but we're doing it anyways. Okay, so we got that. Oh, we need some magnolia leaves. What isopod container wouldn't be complete without some magnolia leaves? Oh, look at that. We can just throw it all in there. Everything that's there, we can throw it all in. And now, the real trick is that we've got to mix it all up. And because that core, that coconut fiber, had a fair bit of moisture content to it, it's going to mix up really, really well, and it'll add some moisture to the whole mix as a whole. Oh, this looks delicious. Now, if I were an isopod, I'd be getting pretty excited about right now. The other one. He hasn't ever even told the wife that we're bringing bugs into your house tomorrow. <laughs> That's even going to be another fun one. Now I will go and cut up uh, some of these branches and stuff and throw that in there, but I really want to show you guys what this mix looks like. Can really get a picture of it now. It's got all the leaf litter. It's got everything all through it. It looks like something you'd find on a forest floor. Now these guys are going to help break all that product down and then all we do is we just keep replenishing it. So beautiful, nice, all organic, lush, perfect mix for isopods. Now I had to take those sticks outside and cut them up outside because they were flying around everywhere. But here's the result. Perfect little tiny pieces. You know, just, there's no regular shape to it at all. Just little tiny sticks, they're all cut up. And they're just gonna make the, the, the mixture really, really loose and airy. So adding a bit of that to the, to the mixtures. It's really nothing fancy. And honestly, the bottom line is most people need to understand is there's no science behind what we're making here. I'm basically making, mimicking a forest floor and, and by people adding things that retain more moisture or less moisture is not really because the animals require more or less. 
uh, you're going to get a nice, that doesn't make sense, but what I'm trying to get at is you're basically making a mixture that'll work best within your schedule because you're the one who's going to have to sit and, all, sit and maintain that, that mixture and maintain the humidity level or the moisture level of that mixture and so forth. So if you're, if you're away from the home a lot, you probably want to want something that retains moisture a little bit longer and dry, dries out a little bit slower than something that holds moisture too long or vice versa. Does that make sense to you guys? I don't know. Biggs likes to babble. Biggs likes to go on. But. So I've got a nice, beautiful, moisture retentive forest floor mix. I think this stuff will work absolutely wonderful. Okay, here's a quick little DIY. This is not my idea. This is not anything fancy. This is legitimately a full-on copy from Cheyenne's uh, setup over there at uh, Species Canada. First, I went and got some of the Sterilite tubs from Home Depot, the exact ones that she was using. I don't think it really matters which brand or anything like that. It's just these ones here. I was happy to be at Home Depot. They're a nice size. There's a good lot of surface area. It's a nice shallow bin, so it's good. They stack really, really nice. And then when the lids go on top and you can drill holes around the perimeter, they'll all stack neatly and they'll still have good ventilation. I took a little piece of cardboard and made a stencil. Uh, similar sort of spacing that she did. She did something venting on the front, venting on, a, on the front halves. And in those ones there, what I did is I heated up a, a, a nail. You could use a soldering iron. It's just as easy. It's just one of the few tools I don't have. But uh, I just heated up a nail using a propane torch and melted it through. One caution is make sure you're always in a really, really well-ventilated well area. I'm in my, my garage. The garage door's wide open and the wind's blowing directly at me, so I'm not going to be inhaling any of the fumes. We're going to use the Dremel tool. We're going to cut out that rectangle on all, all three sides, the front and both sides. We're going to leave the back. It's going to be a little bit more moist so that there's a, a gradient of moisture in between the things so the isopods can find whichever one they want. Uh, I'm going to cut it out using this. Now, important, most important thing, when you're using a cutoff disc, these things can be dangerous. There's parts that are going to fly off here. There's parts that's going to fly off the plastic. So always use safety goggles. The fact that I wear glasses, those are not safety goggles. Always use properly rated safety goggles. Your eyesight's worth more than anything. So let's go ahead and cut one of these out. <laughs> Nothing more to it than that. Piece comes out pretty easy. I'm just gonna use a little knife. And I'm just gonna clean up the, the little bits of extra plastic that came off it. And then the next step is so we're just going to hot glue. We're going to cut a piece of uh, uh, metal window replacement screen, like for a screen window. And we're just going to uh, cut a little piece that's about half an inch bigger all the way around. And honestly, I'm going to just hot glue it in place from the outside. It's nothing pretty, but it's definitely going to work. And it'll keep pests out and keep the isopods in. That's it. Hey, guys. So we had to get the conclosures ready for the isopods that are going to be coming. So I basically got those stair light tubs that you saw me working with in the garage. I cut some holes in them. They're all the even. They're all the same sort of template. I got some metal metal mesh uh, replacement screen for like a screen window, and it's basically just hot glued in place because silicone doesn't really adhere very well to this type of plastic. So it's not pretty, but it's very very functional. And as per Cheyenne's tips, I've got ventilation on the front and on both sides, and then I'm leaving the back third. Uh, ready for uh, a little bit more moisture content. And then the lids, the lids have uh, holes drilled all along, the, all along the perimeter and when they sit on top of each other and they nest, they still have ventilation all the way around. So to get these things ready, we've got all our supplies ready. You guys saw that we've got all the collected oak bark and we've got some oak leaves from the forest floor. We've got some magnolia leaves and I think this is jackfruit leaves that I stole from my uh, supply that I use for feeding the, the little shrimps. Consider isopods are uh, crustaceans, they can have the same stuff that the other guys get. Okay, so to get it started, I had these other tubs that were made up before that I showed you guys when I was mixing that substrate. This is that substrate that is very, very rich. It has the compost, the humus, the long fibered sphagnum moss, the reptile bark or, or orchid bark, and little pieces of hardwood stick and stuff like that. So I'm just gonna put a, a bunch of that in each one of these tubs. Maybe take the lid off. There's not really much to it. Uh, all this stuff was all cleaned and sterilized and stuff in the oven. Uh, we, we did everything on cookie sheets and we did everything that uh, 
came from the wild. Uh, it was in the oven at 350 for about 15 minutes, just to make sure we killed all the pathogens and stuff. Now the real tree trick is, is that we move it forward for just a portion of the back. Again, this is, these are animals that live on the forest floor, so there's nothing fancy about this whatsoever. And this is just straight long fibered New Zealand sphagnum moss. I put a fair bit of that, not only at the back of the containers, but throughout the mix because the animals will actually consume it. But if we put it at the back, not only will they consume it, but it basically is gonna make like a moisture bed for the isopods. Because as the isopods don't have lungs or functional lungs, they actually have gills, same as crustaceans, shrimps and crabs and lobsters, they need a high humidity environment to be able to function properly. So we're gonna give them that area at the back of the enclosure and that way they can find the gradient. If they want a little bit drier, a little bit moister, they've got the options. And that's providing a nice type of environment for them. So breaking up the long fibrous sphagnum moss, we'll mix a bit of it throughout the media. The one thing is, uh, uh, that you'll learn is with isopods is the best thing is that you don't sit there and agitate the media all the time. Once the culture has started, you pretty much just leave it alone because uh, the little tiny babies, I can't remember the name of them, but we'll find out for you. When the babies are, they're very, very delicate. And because they're delicate, you don't want to disturb the soil too much. You can hurt or injure the babies throughout the, the media. Okay, so now we've got our good bed there ready to go. The one thing we've got to do is we're going to moisten everything down fairly well, but mainly with the gradient being moister at the back to drier at the front. This still has a fair bit of moisture content to it because it's from when I soak the core or the coconut fiber. Uh, so it still has a fair bit of moisture. The water in this pressurized jug is reverse osmosis water. You can use uh, uh, reverse osmosis or spring water, but uh, where I live, because I have real hard water with a high iron content, I don't want to use that. So we're going to moisten down the sphagnum moss really, really well. It's going to act like a sponge basically and it'll sit there and retain all the moisture for it. moss nice and moistened. We're pretty much almost ready for the isopods. The thing we're going to do first though is we're going to put a bit of leaf litter. I actually went out into the forest, a nice clean nature area where I knew there wasn't going to be any pesticides or herbicides and I found a felled uh, oak tree that had fallen naturally and I, I just used a, I didn't need any tools or anything and I just stripped the bark off of uh, the, the tree that had already fallen so it's already starting to to rot a little bit. It's perfect, perfect for what our purposes are gonna be. And I've got it all sitting here on uh, one of my wife's cookie sheets. And then I also went and found a bunch of leaf litter. We're a little bit early for all the leaves to be falling, so I only was able to find some, but this leaf litter is, a, is a, it's all wet because today's been a rainy day, but it'll still work. And what we're gonna do is we're actually just gonna get the oven set to 350 degrees. And we're going to put this stuff in there for a good, uh, once it uh, comes to temperature, we're going to put this stuff in there for about 15 minutes or so. And all that's going to do is it's, uh, it's just going to kill any of the pathogens that may be in here. Any of the little mites and whatnots and maybe even there's some native little isopods that we don't want to contaminate our cultures of our tropical species. And these things should be good to go. And this, this is already starting, as you can see, some of the leaves are already starting to break down a little bit. So that's even going to be better. It's going to be a good start. And then in a, by the time I'm going to need more leaf litter, uh, the, the fall will be fully upon us here and I'll be able to collect as much as I need. But this is an excellent start for the day to get those cultures set up. So I've got some nice oak leaves. I'm going to crush up some oak leaves a little bit in there. You don't have to be fancy because the animals will break it down on their own. I'm going to crush up some jackfruit leaves. I believe that's what they are. Basically, you, you want to use uh, hardwood leaves, but not necessarily just, it's, it's not just hardwoods. The reason we say hardwoods is we don't want to have any leaves from anything that's coniferous, meaning we don't want to have anything that's a, like a pine tree or anything like that. Because those things will contain phenols and stuff like that, and those will cause issues inside your enclosure. Okay? 
So again, you can see the gradient that we've made here. This is that moist area that we've sprayed down. Get this one, the sphagnum at the back of the, the enclosure, nice and damp. It'll act like a humidity sink or humidity well for the rest of the enclosure as well. And the next step is adding the, the, the bit of leaf litter. This is the, a large portion of their food source. And then we add the, the cork bark, sorry, cork bark. You can use cork bark as well, and I do have some of that here. But they're not gonna readily consume cork bark the same way that they'll, they'll do with the, with the oak bark. But because I have the pieces, I'm gonna throw them in there. Next step is just give the entire enclosure just a light misting. And these enclosures are ready to go for the isopods.